Hello, I'm David Z. Moster, PhD and Rabbi, and this is 929 Chapters, an exploration of the 929 chapters of the Hebrew Bible. This is brought to you by the Institute of Biblical Culture. Today we'll be studying Genesis chapter 8, the story of the end of the flood of Noah, in English known as Noah. This video will have four parts. I'll begin with a summary and outline of the chapter, then I'll give you my own comment on the chapter, then I'll read some verses in Hebrew and in English, and then finally I'll provide you with a photo related to the chapter. So let's begin with the summary and outline of Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8 falls towards the end of the first section of the book of Genesis. The first section of the book of Genesis is about the first years of creation and also the first years of mankind. And now that the flood is coming to an end in Genesis chapter 8, we are getting closer and closer to the next section in Genesis, which deals with the family of Abraham. I divided the chapter into five sections. In verses 1 to 5, what I call the flood subsides, Yahweh remembers Noah and decides to end the flood. He sends a wind to stop the waters from on high and below, and after another 150 days, the waters stopped gushing. Noah's ark rests on the mountains of Ararat, and then finally, the mountaintops appear. And we are told that these mountaintops appear in the 10th month, and if you recall, the flood began in the second month of that year. In the next section, verses 6 to 12, we deal with Noah's birds. Forty days later, Noah opens the window, and he lets out a raven, and the raven can't find a place to land. Then Noah lets out a dove, and the dove returns to the ark. Seven days later, Noah lets out a dove again, and this time the dove brings an olive branch meaning that the vegetation and trees were beginning to grow. And then seven days after that, Noah lets out a dove, but this time the dove does not return. In verse 13 to 14, we are told that the flood ends and the earth is completely dry on the 27th day of the second month of Noah's 601st year, which is approximately one solar year or 365 days from the beginning of the flood. In the fourth section, we're told that Noah leaves the ark with all of his family and all the animals, and that Yahweh tells them to be fruitful and to multiply. And then finally, in verses 20 to 22, Noah offers sacrifices to Yahweh from the pure animals that he had on board. Yahweh enjoys the smell of the offerings, and Yahweh decides that he will no longer bring punishment to all living things because man really isn't good. Man is really bad, and that's just the way man is. And then finally, Yahweh decides that he will no longer ruin the cycles of the seasons and the days and the nights, meaning there will always be a winter and a summer. Let's move on to part two, the comment, which will focus on the last two verses in which Yahweh decides that he will no longer bring destruction upon all living things. Yahweh says at the end of verse 21, Velo osif od lahakot et kolchai kasher asiti. I will not continue to smite all living things like I have done. Od kol yameha arts for the rest of the days of the earth, zera vekatsir, seed time and harvest time, the kor vechom, cold time and warm time, the kaiets vechoraf, summer time and winter time, the yom velayla and day and night lo yishbotu. They will not cease, meaning the seasons will continue. Now, I highlighted three parallels in this verse. They're called antithetical parallels, which means they're basically opposites. And they are harvest and seed, warm and cold, and summer and winter. The question I would like to ask about these three parallels is how many seasons are there? What I mean by that is that in different places in the world, there are different ways of calculating seasons. For example, in Yonkers, New York, where I live, we have four seasons, winter, spring, summer, and fall. In places near the equator, there's only one season. It's summer all year round. So what's going on in Genesis 8.22? Are there really six seasons? This idea was actually first expressed by Rabbi Meir, a very important rabbi in the second century of the Common Era, who is often quoted in the Mishnah. And Rabbi Meir says that there are actually six seasons. Each season takes up two months of the year, or approximately 17% of the calendar. So, for example, at the end of summer, there's a new season, which is extremely hot. And winter and cold are different seasons because there are different degrees of cold. Now, Rabbi Meir's interpretation is very interesting, and it's based on a hyper-literal reading of this verse. However, based on our understanding of biblical parallelism throughout the Bible, I think that there's really another explanation that makes a lot more sense. So this is going to bring us to a second interpretation, that of Gustav Dahlmann. Gustav Dahlmann was a German who lived between 1855 and 1941. 
Between the years of 1899 and 1914, he lived in the land of Israel, which was called Palestine at that time, and he lived amongst the Palestinian farmers and Bedouin. And what he did was observe how they lived life, how they calculated seasons, how they celebrated festivals, and so on and so forth. And his observations were written after the war in an eight-volume magnum opus called Arbeit und Zita in Palestina, Work and Customs in Palestine. The eighth volume was written after his death. And if you look here, there's an excellent English translation being put out by Nadia Abdul Hadi Sukchian. And what I really like about this translation is that it keeps the same page numbers as Gustav Dahlmann's original. So if you want to go look right back at the German, you can easily find it. Now, when Dalman was speaking to the natives about how they calculated time, he learned that there aren't six seasons, there's actually only two seasons. And those seasons were winter and summer, alternatively known as rain and summer. And there was even an Arab proverb which said six months are summer and six months are rain. So this is how people living in the land before the great turnovers of the Industrial Revolution and World War I and then World War II would have understood the calendar. There's really only two seasons. And Dalman points out that this is also a biblical view itself. For example, in Zechariah 14.8, it mentions it will be so for summer, kayats, and winter, chorif. It only mentions two seasons. It doesn't have the other four. And there are a number of other examples where only kayats or chorif are mentioned without any other explanation. Now, this leads to a question. When did the winter begin and end? And when did the summer begin and end? And Dahlman really recorded a fascinating insight from the local Bedouin. And he writes, Among the Bedouin, the setting and rising of the Pleiades is considered to be decisive for the change between the two great seasons of the year. The Pleiades is a formation of about seven stars known as the Seven Sisters, and it's one of the brightest spots in the night sky. Interestingly, the Pleiades is actually mentioned in the Bible itself in three different cases, Amos 5.8, Job 9.9, and Job 38.31, and I'll have those verses written out in the description of this video. Now, the interesting thing about the Pleiades is that it, like all constellations relative to Earth, looks as if it moves in the night sky throughout the seasons. So, for example, if you were in Jerusalem in the middle of November looking straight up at the night sky like this, you would see the Pleiades right above you. However, in May, if you were in Jerusalem and you stayed up all night, you wouldn't be able to see the Pleiades at all. It doesn't even break the horizon. And the Bedouin noticed that when the Pleiades reaches its high point or its low point, that's exactly when the seasons turn over in the land of Israel. Dalman writes, as the proverb says, this is an Arabic proverb, the Pleiades set over impassable valleys, whose bottom has become a stream, meaning when the Pleiades goes down, it is wet winter time, and the Pleiades rises over dried wheat sheaves, meaning when it rises in the night sky, it is actually summertime. And there's a really cool program, it's free, and I'll have a link to it below, it's called Stellarium, and on Stellarium you can calculate the rise and fall of the Pleiades from a place such as Jerusalem. And we can see here that as it is setting, it is the winter time, January, February, March, April, May. This is around Passover. Around Passover over time in May, the season is going to start turning and the summer is going to begin when you harvest your crops. June, July, August, September, October, November, and over here is the last harvest where you're going to harvest your fruits and then again the winter is going to come and you are going to start seeding again. And it's winter, it's rainy, and you're seeding your crops. So based on all of this, we have a new understanding of Genesis 8.22. Yahweh isn't saying, oh, there are six seasons that I'm going to keep forever. No, he's saying that the two seasons in the land of Israel will be kept forever. And they are the harvest warm summer and the seed cold winter. So what this means is that the three cases of antithetical parallelism are actually all describing the same thing. One way is harvest and seed, another way is warm and cold, another way is summer and winter, and this threefold repetition is a poetic way to draw emphasis on these seasons. Okay, that does it for our comment today. Let's move on to the reading section, and the verses I chose are verses 15 to 17, when Yahweh tells Noah to leave the ark. Vayidaber Elohim al Noach lemor. And God said to Noach, saying, Say minateva, leave the ark. Ata, ve'ishtacha, uvanecha, unesheivanecha itach. You, your wife, your sons, your sons' wives, with you. Kolachaya asher itach, every animal that is with you, mikol basar ba'of uva bahema uvachol haremes haromes al haaretz, from all flesh of the birds, of the animals, and all the creepy things on the land. Hotzei itach, 
Take them out with you, the Shartsuba arts, and they will swarm on the land, Ufaru Varavu Allah arts, and they will be fruitful and multiply on the land. This brings us to part four of the video, the public domain and easy shareable photo. And I chose verse 13 for this photo. Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and saw that the face of the ground was drying. And here we have a beautiful scene of a puddle evaporating and being soaked up by the ground. That does it for today's video, Genesis chapter 8. I hope you enjoyed. This video is brought to you by the Institute of Biblical Culture, where you can take classes with professors such as myself and other really fantastic professors. And if you're not ready for a class, you can join in a free study group while you're at it. For more information about Genesis chapter 8 or any chapter in the Hebrew Bible, be sure to check out my website, 929chapters.com. And I thank you for listening, and I look forward to seeing you for Genesis chapter 9.